Welcome to the shop. Well, the sculpture is proceeding. The aluminum part came out really nice. And as usual, while I was making it, I thought of a couple of things that would have made it maybe go a tiny bit better, a tiny bit smoother. But I mean, that always happens when doing a prototype for the first time. Anyway, it came out good enough. In fact, better than good enough. The, the final part ended up uh, pretty much exactly as intended. And now I'm going to start experimenting with uh, making the wood inlay. Now, I've done a lot of inlays before using the uh, CNC wood router. Never done one exactly like this before. So there's going to be a bit of experiment going on, a bit of uh, head scratching and trying to figure out, is this really the right way to do it? Um, because the uh, hardwood blank that I'm going to be making, first of all, hardwood is kind of expensive and I don't have that much in stock and I don't want to go to the lumber yard. Um, but also, it takes a while to uh, cut and sand and glue and assemble my veneer pieces. And I certainly don't want to waste them if I'm going to be doing something stupid. So I'm going to be starting off here with just a piece of scrap MDF, total junk, and just going to see, does the tool path work? And more importantly, does it fit in the aluminum? because that really is the question. How tight can I make it fit into the aluminum? And what's an even more interesting question is how do I hold the piece? The inlay that I'm making it, it pretty much is an unstable geometric shape. It has very thin sections, um, a lot of area with a lot of thin sections, and it, there's really no way to cut it if you just take the piece and try to cut it. So my idea is I'm going to glue the hardwood onto MDF, cut it on the MDF using the MDF as a support, and then after verifying that it fits properly, which I can do because the pattern is symmetric, so I can kind of like flip it over. Both sides should be identical since they're cut on CNC. So. Uh, once I determine that it fits, I can then cut the piece off using the bandsaw and hopefully uh, not destroy it in the process and then, uh, and then glue it into the aluminum frame. So uh, for those who haven't seen this setup before, it's a kind of an interesting setup that probably is worth talking about a little bit. On the CNC router table, first of all, I have my fourth axis mounted here for making in koala handles, which kind of forces me, unless I want to tear apart my setup, I need to move my uh, regular uh, three axis setup over here a bit, which is a tiny bit annoying to have to bend over. The table here is one inch MDF faced with a facing cutter on the machine. So I've got reasonable confidence within the accuracy of this thing, and no, it's nowhere near as good as the mini mill, but it's actually surprisingly good for what it is. So I've got my surface uh, flat and parallel and perpendicular to the axes of the machine. Then I drilled an array of half-inch holes, two-inch on center, and then made a bunch of these blocks where it's one, two, I got a one, one and a half, two, two and a half inches. I forget what it is. It's not important. So the blocks have a pin. Pin goes in the hole, and that leaves a little gap here. So then I take these little spacers and kind of like rummage through the pile and find the little spacer that fits correctly and then jam them together. They're kind of like wedge. These are cut from uh, shim shingles that carpenters use for uh, hanging doors, among other things. So I basically just find the smallest gap that I can get and then jam in a wedge. And it doesn't hold it perfectly. 
Um, but it, de depending on the cut that I'm making, it holds it well enough. And obviously, if I was going to be doing some really heavy work, I would jam it in a little bit better. But for what I'm doing today, hey, this is fine. So the blank from MDF is clamped in place. I'm going to put my uh, zero finder nowhere near as accurate as the Renishaw uh, probe on the mini mill. But like everything about this machine, it's good enough. Does the job. And I don't have an automatic tool changer yet. I've actually ordered one. And so I'm going to kind of there's a little wrench is just too short. I think I ranted about that in a different video about why do they sell these short little wrenches for ER collets. So going to be starting out with a half inch router bit. The spindle is a three phase spindle that runs at 25,000 RPM. It's connected to a variable frequency drive, so it can be slowed down if needed. But for wood, faster is better. So got that in place. I think I probably set the wrong work offset. Work offset one is the fourth axis. Work offset two is here, so it's off to the CAD room. So every one of my systems has different behavior. Always something to complain about. Mach 3 won't let you modify a file if it's loaded. So I forgot to clear the file. OK. One of the truly unfortunate parts of the design of my shop, and I think I said this before, that when the shop was originally uh, constructed out of a residential three-car garage with, with a bunch of other adjoining rooms, when the shop was first constructed, it was a wood shop. And then I took up glass working and tried to find a place to put the glass working shop. And then I got a bunch of machines and started doing machine work. And as a result of this kind of haphazard um, evolution of the shop, the CNC wood router is in the glass working shop. And boy, that sucks, especially when cutting MDF, because it makes dust like you wouldn't believe. So. You know, I'm stuck with what I'm stuck with. I can't really imagine an easy solution that wouldn't just be insanely complex. So for the moment, I'm going to try to control the dust as well as I can by turning on my glass working ventilator and using a hand vacuum. But uh, wow, I hate dust. My wife hates it more than I do. Jog over here. finger on the stop button at all times. Fortunately, uh, one thing I didn't talk about, which is probably worth mentioning here, the everything on this wood router is all the clamping and fixturing is all made of wood or sometimes plastic. The only metal I have here is the fourth axis. And so if something goes wrong and I end up you know, going too deep or too wide or whatever, I'm not going to break the router bit. I mean, I'll probably tear up the table. As you can see, there's probably a few little oopsies on the table. Um, nothing serious. Table is still usable. So anyway, going to be careful. Got the, and yeah, this is going to be, <laughs> this is going to be loud. So hopefully 
Mr. Wireless Microphone will be up to the challenge and will be able to actually hear what I have to say, or maybe nobody cares what I have to say. So. Who knows? So I am ready. Safety glasses on. Finger on the stop button. Probably going way too slow here. Probably can speed that up a tremendous amount, but I'm doing a spiral entry. And the spiral entry is done at the plunge rate. So there we go at the proper cutting rate. When I first set up the uh, CNC router, I attempted to put a dust collector on it, and it kind of worked a little bit, but boy, it was more of a pain in the ass than it was worth. So, at the moment, it's got no dust collector, and I manage the best I can. The MDF dust is really fine and it gets airborne at the slightest provocation. So I'm pretty sure now that I look at it that I'm going to be having a problem on this part. So, as much as I try to plan ahead, sometimes it just, it doesn't work correctly. Now that I'm looking at this, I'm realizing that if I cut my outer perimeter, I'm going to booger up my clamping boards. So I think I'll go rethink this. See you later. Okay, I'm back again. And, you know, why do I leave stuff like this in the video? Because this is the way I work, and I suspect that it's probably common. I think a lot of people may work this way, that I'm thinking about a bunch of different things, and I try to get them all right. I always try to get them all right, but sometimes, you know, I get 20 things right, and then one thing I just didn't think of. So I've got a blank now cut a half inch bigger than the previous blank, because if I would have continued on the old blank, I would have dug into my clamping boards, and I don't want to do that. I've been using these for years. So, anyway, let's try it again. So, get over here to the I probably didn't need to do that. I bet the machine still remembered where the zero was, but, but hey, it's okay.
Finger on the stop button. Going a little faster now. MDF is a wonderful material. I love it. It's cheap, it's uniform, paints up really well. It doesn't stand up real well to water. Get it wet and it'll swell up like a sponge. It's great for stuff like this, where I'm just testing geometry and don't want to waste a piece of nice wood. But boy, it makes horrid dust. I just hate MDF dust. Of course, when I'm using the hand vacuum, my finger is pretty far away from the stop button. So I hope nothing goes wrong. That works perfectly. Yep, total success. When I first moved into the house and learned that I had a 2,500 square foot area on the lower floor to work with, I thought, wow, I'll never run out of space. Ha! I'm running out of space already. I've been thinking of moving into an industrial space, but I really, really like being able to just work at home. Go up, get a snack. But there is more than a small chance that eventually I'll have to make the switch and move the entire enterprise into an industrial building. Of course, the good news is that there's a lot of empty industrial space in Grass Valley. Probably even in the Lytton building. I think they got a lot of space for rent. Wouldn't that be weird? Have the Inquala being made in the Lytton building. Uh. 
Okay. Finger on the stop button. Looking good. Doing the finish cut with a quarter inch bit because I think those corner radii may be bigger, may be smaller. But so far, everything is going well. When I create a tool path on the CAM system on Bobcad, it has a graphic simulator built in, and I always simulate toolpaths before running it, and so it's It's usually pretty successful. The when I make mistakes in toolpath, it's usually running into fixtures, running into hold down screws, getting the toolpath wrong, uh, getting the uh, work offset wrong. Uh, I've actually started putting uh, cross checks into my G code so that the G code, at least on the mini mill, uh, checks to make sure that the uh, measured work offset is what's expected. So I've got a little bit of an idiot proofing there. And yeah, I'm sure that there probably are people who do this kind of work who never make mistakes. And yeah, I wish that was me. But uh, I do everything I can to, <coughs> to have systems, cross checks, uh, checklist, set up sheets, double check, triple check, check the check, check again, measure twice, cut once, and uh, just try to avoid making mistakes. So let's give this a test. Now here's the, the mating part. And As expected, it doesn't fit. Now this is not a surprise. This is as expected. And actually I would be a tiny bit disappointed if it fit, especially if it just dropped right in and wiggled around a little bit. Typically when I'm doing work like this, I like to sneak up on it. So. I'm going to go back in the CAD room and uh, change the tool path by five thousandths and run the finish again and see if it gets any better. And I'll just keep going until, until I got the pig to oink. And then once the, the, the aluminum part fits, then I'll take it over to the bandsaw and uh, cut it off from its support so that I can observe all of the geometry, make sure it's right, and then if everything is right, I'll start assembling the hardwood pieces that, of course, you know, nothing is simple on this project. So the, uh, the hardwood pieces are going to be cut in a somewhat challenging uh, design, glued together on a MDF substrate. Um, they're they're going to be cut on the bandsaw, sanded on the drum sander. Lots of work, lots of steps. So I'll be back. After checking the CAD drawing, I realized I don't need a tool change. The radius is perfectly fine with a half inch cutter. Load up the finish only pass and probably should redo the tool change map. Well, actually, I 
I have a automatic tool changer on order. Believe it or not, some dude, probably a small shop dude, very much like me, some dude actually is making an automatic tool changer for a CNC gantry router. And hopefully with any luck, it'll improve my process a bit. Finger on the stop button. Five thousandths. So does this machine hold a thousandth? Not really. I haven't actually measured what the accuracy is, but it's open loop stepper motors on a rack and pinion. Who knows what accuracy these teeth are cut with. And of course the whole thing, it's a noodle, it's flexible, it's got no rigidity at all. But that was really good woodwork. Wood doesn't need machine shop tolerance. Well, actually, you know, the more accurate the better, but I've had great success making nice looking woodwork on this machine. So I'm taking five thousandths. All appears to be going well. I'm running Mach 3 on a Windows 10 box, and it seems to work well enough for what I do. Like all software, it has its annoyances, it has its quirks. I see no need to move to Mach 4. Mach 3 seems to do what I need, and at least on the bridge port, which also runs Mach 3, uh, Mach 4 doesn't have a, a driver for the Galil motion card. Oh boy. That looks like, that is right on the edge of fitment. Get zooks. I could probably hammer it in place. So I am going to go back to the CAD room and give it another, another two thousandths, I think. Okay, another two thousandths. And in this case, I don't need, because the, the tool hasn't changed, the workpiece hasn't changed, don't need to do a, don't need to do a measurement here. The wood router was my first CNC machine. And uh, yes, for those who are curious, I'm 100% self-taught CNC machinist. The only machine training that I ever had was high school metal shop, where I learned to use manual machine, manual lathe, manual mill, manual surface grinder. Uh, all of my CNC has been self-taught. And for those of you who want to learn CNC, I strongly recommend getting a wood router. The pretty much everything about it is the same. G-code is G-code. Work offset is work offset. Fixturing is fixturing. Uh, computing tool path, it's all the same. And it's... Uh, you know, you, the, the, the wood router is cheaper, and you, the parts that you break if you make a mistake are cheaper. So strongly recommended. Learn CNC on a wood router.
course, because of the way I'm doing this, I'm slightly blind here, and I can't really judge if it's uniformly off or off in one dimension or all I know is that it almost fits so a couple of more thousands be sure to remember to clear boy there's a lot of things to remember in this process okay um, hopefully with any luck this will be the winner Twenty five thousand RPM. This is an air cooled spindle. And for the kind of work I do and the duty cycle I do, air cooling is fine. It does get kind of uncomfortably hot when I'm doing a long operation. If this was a production shop and I was running all day every day. I would definitely get a water-cooled spindle because I think this guy, I'm not sure if it would overheat and hurt itself or just overheat and smell funny or what would happen, but it does get somewhat uncomfortably hot after several hours of even lightweight cutting, even doing like uh, profile milling where I'm barely just taking a, a few thousandths at a time. So, all appears to be going well. Oh, for those who are interested, this machine is from a company called CNC Router Parts, and it came disassembled, and I had to assemble it and troubleshoot it, and yes, it did take more than a little bit of troubleshooting to get it to work, but I'm a control systems engineer. I'm an electronic engineer. It's no big deal. I believe they got bought by somebody else now. I think they're now their name is Avid. And usually when a company gets acquired, it's bad news, but I really don't have any experience dealing with Avid. Hey, there we go. Wow. No wiggle whatsoever. Fits great. So, I'm going to cut that off with the bandsaw and just make sure that all the internal parts work correctly because obviously when I'm putting it on blind like that, I can't see what's going on. So I'm going to cut it off with the bandsaw and uh, see if all is well. <clears throat> and then I'm going to glue up the real hardwood to make the, uh, the hardwood inlay part. So, see you later. So I'm out at the uh, woodworking side of the shop and I've got the bandsaw set up now. I'm using a three quarter inch carbide tipped blade with an accessory fence that I use for, I actually make my own veneer out of hardwood sometimes when I'm doing veneering. And this blade kind of keeps itself under control and doesn't wander and produces a pretty nice cut. So now I'm going to uh, section the test piece. And then of course, when I get the the, the actual piece made, the actual hardwood piece made that will be glued to MDF. I'm going to use the same trick to remove it from the support stock. Got a pusher stick here. Slow. Mm 
when doing very, very long cuts like this, it's very difficult. When I started the first veneer work I ever did, I used a half inch kind of regular steel blade. And when it was perfectly sharp and perfectly adjusted, I could actually get a decent cut. But if it gets a little bit dull, especially on one side, a little bit out of adjustment, it will make the most horrible out of control cut you ever saw. And yeah, it probably probably wasn't quite. I'm a little bit a little bit small. I'm not sure if it's worth. I and mean, I can break this out by hand. I think I'll break it out by hand. And of course, when I do the real one, I'll adjust everything to do it a little more accurately. But hey, for this one, I think I'll just break it out by hand over to the belt sander, kind of fix it up a little bit. So there it is. And yeah, that looks good enough to me. That looks pretty close to perfect. I don't think I'm going to get it any better. Yeah, it does have a, a tiny bit of imperfection, but I am not going to continue dicking with it. I'm going to call it macaroni. So. The next step here is to get the stuff out of the way here, reconfigure the shop a little bit. The woodworking shop is also used to park a car, so I have to kind of reconfigure a bit when I'm doing this. Get my piece of hardwood here. Don't exactly remember what kind of wood this is. And of course everything runs into everything else because the shop is too small. I have too many tools. I'm a tool junkie. I'm a tool addict. I can't stop buying tools. So I'll go get my dimensions. I'll be right back. going to be making a, a little pattern here. kind of want to have a little bit of design in the way the grain is oriented. So I'm going to cut four somewhat triangular pieces. The only tricky part of this is that they have to meet at a point, and the point will not be hidden. So, got to make my point nice and sharp. Uh, here goes, and I think I can probably make this guy a little bit thicker to allow for sanding. Cutting very nicely. Totally feels like it's in control. When the blade starts, when the blade goes bad, when the blade is a little dull or not set up correctly, I can feel it, the way the material is going through. And this feels like it's cutting totally perfectly. Very nice cut. 
But what I am noticing, which is somewhat unfortunate, that when you cut hardwood, sometimes the wood has some internal stresses in it. And when the internal stresses are relieved, the wood starts moving a little bit. So, before I cut the next piece, I'll probably go over to the belt sander and see if I can That became a banana! It's interesting that the, the piece that, well, the piece that was against the fence did curve a little bit. I don't know, what should I do? A really nice looking wood. That's a nice piece of wood. So for those who don't know and who haven't seen this trick before, I'm going to be using paper templates that I'm going to be gluing onto the wood and then cutting and sanding the wood to shape. up to the line on the template. The template was made on a, on a laser printer and it was made from the CAD drawing and it's actually, actually quite a, a good method produces surprisingly accurate results and of course for the blank it, it doesn't really need to be that accurate. The only thing that needs to be accurate is where all of the triangular parts meet at a point. Oh. I'm going to cut them crudely to begin with. Then, get my trash can, I'm going to use 3M number 77. This is a really excellent spray adhesive, but the problem is it gets everywhere. I mean it gets everywhere. So. I usually when I'm doing this I hold my piece in the trash can and it doesn't take much. It does not take very much at all.
Hey, you know what? Am I going to be able to... Nah, not quite. Almost. I've used this trick for many years and had great success with it. And that's that. Next part of the operation. The sander is shared between wood and metal. The disc is a little bit worn down from doing metal, but I think that's actually going to be OK, because I don't want a super aggressive cut here when I'm being careful. So. Slightly higher magnification safety glasses here. Nope. For those who don't know, sharing a uh, sander in a wood shop and a metal shop is always a problem because once you sand metal, it kind of like dulls the sanding disc and it'll never do wood again properly. So I'm going to turn off the camera and change the disc. Okay, fresh new disc. And there we have it. Okay, so we've got a, a substrate here. <clears throat> and the pieces are going to be glued kind of like that, thusly. They are very, very close, but not good enough. So now comes the next stage of refinement here. The paper templates have done their job. And the next little bit of fitting will be done by hand with sandpaper. So let's Yes it is. It is very, very close. So what I do here 
another common trick. And let me move the GoPro over there. It's another very common trick. The table of a table saw is a really super flat surface. You put a piece of sandpaper on it, and then very carefully holding the piece perpendicular, you can pretty accurately refine that this is just the finest of adjustment here. The piece is almost fit. Very close. But I can get them closer. The disc sander, compared to a belt sander, a disc sander can make a very, very, very flat result, but not perfect. Better than a belt sander, but even a disc sander, when you press a piece up against a disc sander, it's good, but, but not perfect. And I can see, as I'm refining the shape here, trying to straighten this out. And yeah, I know I could have probably fixtured it and done it on the CNC, but you know, sometimes I do drift back into the world of handwork when it's easy. So yeah, there's, I can see some perpendicular scratches in the center, which means that that edge was not straight. And of course, those of you who have never done inlaying, there is a trick and everybody cheats, that when you glue up your inlay and you got some glue in whatever cracks may, whatever imperfect cracks there may be, then you got a little bit of glue there, and then you sand the top, the sawdust fills it in. It's an old luthier's trick from a long time ago. Of course, I just want it to be perfect, so I try my best. But I know that when it's done, even if I do, even if I do have it open a thousandth, it'll fill with sawdust and glue and be so perfect nobody will ever know. Wow, that's close. That is so close. So that, I'm going to stop dicking with it. That's good enough. Okay, time for clamping, and boy, I've got the clamps. You can never have too many clamps. So, the, the glue on the bottom, I'm probably going to do it fairly carefully, but keep in mind that the attachment of this part to the substrate, the substrate is just a fixture. So I like it to be secure, but it doesn't have to be the world's greatest glue joint. 
and get the first guy in place here. And if this was going to be the, the finished beautiful surface, I would use a call. And for those who don't speak the language, a call is just a piece of scrap wood that you put on top of your nice wood to keep the clamp from making a dent. But everything is oversized. Everything's going to get sanded down. So, going to be fine. So here's a story about clamps. In the 70s, when I was working my way through college, I built cabinets, speaker cabinets, actually built a touring sound system in my parents' garage when I was working my way through college. So after college, I opened a cabinet shop and made some really cool stuff. I mean, people looked at my work and said, wow, how do you do that? I've never seen anybody, i never, never seen work like that. Wow, that's great. Unfortunately, I didn't make any money. Went bankrupt. And when I had my tools for sale, it was long before Craigslist, back when you would put an ad in the classified ads in the local newspaper. I was selling all my tools. And the number one question that I got asked over and over again, the phone just wouldn't stop ring ringing. And everybody said, got any clamps? Got any, how many clamps do you have? You want to sell your clamps? You got any clamps? Nobody cared about the really nice pin router or the sliding table saw, all the other really cool tools. Everybody asked about clamps. Well, hey, you got any clamps? How many clamps do you got? What kind of clamps are they? I'm looking for some clamps. Something to keep in mind for anybody who isn't an experienced wood clamper. Glue is a lubricant. You know, right before it sticks, it's like oil. And well, let's see. Right before it sticks, it's just like oil. And your piece will move, I guarantee. So it's good to kind of sneak up on it, apply a little bit of clamping pressure, just to kind of get it kissed in place. Let's see if I can get this one to work. Of course, if I was prepared, I would have done the clamp design before turning on the camera, but hey, it's okay. Harbor Freight clamps can't be beat. When good enough is good enough. Yes, I believe. I believe that is good enough. The joints look tight. They all meet at the center point. Going to turn the camera off. Let the glue dry. And I'll see you later.